So let me say that we are following here in Sweden and as is in the rest of the world, or at least the rest of Europe or the Western world, the, um, the war on Ukraine uh, and the horrendous acts uh, against uh, Ukraine and in Ukraine. And of course, the recent attack in Odessa a few days ago, it's really touching, was when people, 12 people died, including five children, were, uh, and a number of people were injured. It was just so terrible. And my thoughts go to all of you that live there and have roots in Odessa. Uh, I've worked with Ukrainian colleagues since 2014. I was uh, uh, in Maidan and Kiev already in the spring of 2014. So I have quite a strong uh, personal relation to what has taken place since 2014. That's why I'm touched. Okay, so, so today we see uh, on a constant basis the human suffering as a result of the aggressive military invasion. Uh, and it may be provocative to raise concern about how to protect the environment. Why care about the environment when people are being shot at and starving or fleeing for their lives? And when thousands are dying? Well, the answer is quite simple because that there is a clear connection between the, a safe natural environment and the living conditions of the human beings, the environmental consequences of war impact natural, terrestrial and maritime resources, the air and public health. The people of Ukraine know this and the authorities of Ukraine know this. Since the last scale invasion of 24th February 2022, the Ministry of Ecology and Natural Resources in Ukraine has collected information on the environmental damage caused by the Russian war against a war of aggression against Ukraine. This turned out to be a foresighted initiative. The environmental destruction that has taken place and continues to take place in Ukraine is appalling and goes far beyond what can be labeled as collateral damage. On May 12, 2022, the ministry launched an official web resource and a mobile application, Eco Sagrosa, environmental threat in Ukrainian, if I have understood it correctly. According to the ministry at the time, it was said to be an, an application that features an interactive map of Ukraine with monitoring data of air quality and radiation levels, as well as information on environmental crimes committed by the Russian occupiers. The app uses also, can be also used to report environmental crimes that have with that people, individual have with I saw that pay, I saw that information and the establishment of this Eco Zaragoza Zagrosa uh, already in 2022. And when I checked it now again, it's really expanded enormously. And it's a very, very, very impressive work. And I also noted that, that there is even a green line directly to the ministry to report environmental. Uh, devastation and damage. So, the an important step uh, uh, in this uh, this was an important step in the direction what I will label as environmental accountability, and that the inclusion of an immediate protection of the environment as part of. President Zelensky's peace plan initially presented to the G70 G20 meeting in 15th on 15th October November 2022. And point eight, as many of you are very familiar, relates to the immediate protection of the environment. And uh, it reads that the huge damage to the environment and wildlife 
was that was caused by Russian uh, that caused by Russian invasion, burned forests, mined fields, polluted waters, killed animals, just as the environmental damage caused by the Russians following the Kharkovka hydroelectric power plant dam has been approximately at the time that is two years ago almost one and a half years ago US dollar 1.5 billion. But it's hard to put numbers on damage that has changed the ecosystem for decades to come. And that is a challenge for the whole world. And I think that is a very important point. It's not an issue for Ukraine. It's a question for the rest of the world. However, it should be underlined that this specific point, point eight, is not the only one related to the environment in Zelensky's peace plan because it also contains points on radiation and nuclear safety, food security, energy security, and justice, all of which are directly related to the protection and the restoration of the environment. Before I continue with the situation in Ukraine, allow me to make a few comments on the historical background and the legal context with regard to the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts. The negative impacts of the environment during and after an armed conflict has been seen before. From the Vietnam War in the 1960s and 70s to the Gulf War in early 1990s, the awareness of environmental risks from military action grew slowly but surely. Many of us remember shocking images of environmental destructions. Those of us who are old enough, I was quite young at the time, but I was still born. The, uh, such as the Agent Orange defoliation in Vietnam or the plundering of Kuwait, where 600 oil wells were set on fire by retreating Iraqi forces during the Gulf War. Similarly, more recent conflicts in the former Republic of Yugoslavia, Kosovo, Iraq, Sierra Leone, Lebanon, and Liberia have all demonstrated the high environmental uh, cost of war torn societies. In Mali, we have witnessed the connection between conflict, climate, and environment. And in Myanmar, the military coup has had the result of hindering modern environmental considerations, including arresting environmental activists. And what will become of Gaza, we don't know. And now we see the devastating environmental consequences on, of the war on aggression against Ukraine. The environmental consequences, of course, did not start with the large scale invasion on the 24th February 2022, but already with the aggression against Ukraine in 2014. However, the effects and scale of impact since 24th February 2022 is of a different magnitude. So the question is, how far does the law allow the destruction of the environment during an armed conflict? Well, perhaps not so far as many may imagine. So let's just recall the very, very basic rules. And they are quite simple. The natural environment is a civilian ob object. And a civilian object, uh, it, can, it may never be attacked unless it has become a military objective. But in essence, the natural environment is a civilian object. The environment must not be modified and used as a weapon. And likewise, attacks on the natural environment by means of reprisals are prohibited. All the customary principles of the law of armed conflict apply. The principle of distinction, the principle of proportionality, and the precautions in attack, as well as the rules of military necessity and humanitarian consideration, including the Markens Clause. That is the clause that says that when there are no specific rules to apply in a situation, you should always take into account humanitarian considerations. So irrespective of these principles, the 
leaders must show due regard to the protection and preservation of the environment. And this is spelled out in Article 55, Paragraph 1 of the 1977 Additional Protocol 1 to the 1949 Geneva, Geneva Conventions. It states that care, and I quote, care shall be taken in warfare to protect the natural environment against widespread, long-term and severe damage. This protection includes a prohibition of the use of methods and means of warfare which are intended or may be expected to cause such damage to the natural environment and thereby prejudice the health and survival of the population. It is, worth, it is also worth noticing that in the context of the law of armed conflict, we refer to the natural environment and not only the environment, whereas the International Law Commission and the work on the Perak principle, as Rita referred to, uses the word, the term, the environment, and I'll come back to that later. You can also note the clean connection in Article 55, Para 1 of Additional Protocol 1 between damage to the environment and the health and survival of the population. So, the law, so we will now move on to just address very quickly the issue of responsibility and accountability. Uh, the law of armed, clip, armed conflict apply, uh, does not give a sufficient answer if we want to address responsibility and accountability. We need to study the wider circle of international law and we need to make a distinction between the responsibility of a state and the criminal responsibility of an individual. Our starting point here is the distinction between jus ad bellum and jus in bello. If a state has breached the fundamental obligation not to use force against another state, that is the UN Charter, Article 2, Para 4, which includes the prohibition of aggression, we refer to a breach of jus ad bellum and then the rules on state responsibility kicks in. Once the hostilities have broken out, we refer to the law on armed conflict, the use symbello, which is equally applicable to both parties to a conflict, irrespective of whether it is an aggressor or whether it's defending its territory. This has to be, this have to be, this has to be said, even if we know that what we are here looking at is, uh, is the aggression by Russia against Ukraine. And the thousands and thousands and thousands of war crimes that have taken place on from the Russian side against the Ukrainian combatants and the Ukrainian territory. An aggressive state, Russia, will, will always be obliged to make reparations to the state that is the object of its aggression. Such reparation can take different forms, but their aggressive state can never be relieved of its responsibility. There is no statute of limitation. Let me first also make, make a few remarks on the different legal concepts, such as war crimes, grave breaches, serious violations of international humanitarian law, ecocide, environment, and environmental war crimes. War crimes is the most encompassing term that have come to cover most breaches of, inter the, inter of, uh, of the law of armed conflicts in international and non-international armed conflicts. Grey breaches, on the other hand, grey breaches of international humanitarian law are the most severe breaches of international humanitarian law applicable in international armed conflicts. 
here states are bound to act. They cannot remain passive if a grave breach has been committed. They must, the states, they must search for the perpetrator and adjudicate or extradite the suspect. The um, concept of serious violations of international humanitarian law is most often used in, is, is used now to also cover breaches of international humanitarian war law in non-international armed conflicts. You don't find it in the Geneva Conventions or in the additional protocol, but you will find it in the specific treaties on Rwanda, the former Yugoslavia, and of course, in the International Criminal Court Statute. So the term ecocide is not a term in and of itself in international law. It was in fact used already more than 50 years ago. Not, and it's sometimes said that the Swedish former prime minister Olof Palme used the term at the very early stage. However, it is not yet an international law term. As many of you would know, there is now an initiative to make ecocide a crime under international criminal law by including it in the statute of the International Criminal Court. The, the proponents stop ecocide now have suggested a definition of the crime of ecocide to be included in as Article 8 ter in the Rome Statute. The, def the proposed definition reads as follows. For the purpose of this statute, ecocide means unlawful or wanton act committed with the knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. As you can see, as you can see, the definition is not cumulative like the one in the additional protocol that I was referred to earlier, which talks about severe, widespread and long-term. But here it is suggested a definition that more relies on what is uh, what is written in the so-called NMOD convention, namely severe, widespread or long-term. However, it is worth noticing that the concept of ecocide occurs in many national legislations, including, as far as I have understood, both in Ukraine and in Russia. Technically, it means that a person under the jurisdiction of any of these states that have, that have such a, 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 a legislation may be indicted for the crime of ecocide as defined in that national legislation. The concept environmental war crimes is not a proper legal term. It is used, including by me, to indicate some type of war crime that has environmental consequences. The um, jurisdiction of the International Criminal Course, Court covers all layers of war crimes, irrespective of the categorization of the conflict. Note that means that also non-international uh, conflicts are included in the jurisdiction of the court. But it should be noted that the ICC is a complementary mechanism. The main option is that war crimes should be dealt with by domestic courts. That's why it is even more important that Ukraine continues its, its collection of evidence and examples of situations where the environment have been destroyed. Because combatants bear a personal responsibility for war crimes. They don't have to be grave breaches, but war crimes in general, that they have committed. If suspected of a war crime, they have to face criminal proceedings 
in accordance with the rules of law. For obvious reason, the law of armed conflict, the use in Bello, only applies during or as a result of an armed conflict. The state involved has a legal responsibility to ensure that the law of warfare is implemented and upheld by its armed forces. A breach of this obligation is a breach of international law and entails state responsibility. This means that the state can be held accountable for a breach of international law, both, both when it breaches jus ad bellum, the prohibition of aggression, and when it has not fulfilled its obligation to ensure that its soldiers on, are complying international, are complying the rules of international humanitarian war, law, the law of armed conflict. Why I insist of referring to the law of armed conflict is because it is a wider concept than the law, international humanitarian law. It includes not only international humanitarian law, it includes the law of occupation and the law of neutrality. The crime of aggression, uh, we, I will say a few words about that. A military aggression against another state is a breach of international law and it takes responsibility of that state. Such a breach of Jussi ad bellum is totally independent from any breaches of the law of armed conflict, the use in Bello. It is most likely that the state that is subject to an aggression will demand reparation from the aggressor state in accordance with our international law. Such reparations can take many different forms, but in case of damage to the environment, it is likely to request be a request for full reparation. It should be noted that there is an emerging trend that also individuals that have lost their relatives have been injured or have had their property destroyed request compensation from the aggressor states. Such demands will be based on human rights law, environmental law and civil law. And we may expect numerous legal processes of the kind of that kind in the future. A golden rule of course for a lawyer is that nothing is proven until all facts of evidence are presented to a court and tried in a proper procedure when it comes to these individual cases. This is also the case with the events taking place in Ukraine. But it is not difficult to conclude that there are thousands of thousands of cases to examine. The, um, let me say a few words about the International Law Commission's PIRAC principles, the principles of the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict. In 1922, 2022, the UN ILC, International Law Commission, concluded its substantive work on the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict. And as Britta mentioned, I was the first rapporteur on that topic. 27, and it was, I must say, admittedly, I must admit initially, it was a little bit of an uphill battle. But 20, in the end, 22, 27 important principles were adopted by the Commission and presented to the UN General Assembly. As suggested by the Commission, the General Assembly took note of the principle and attached them to a UN uh, General Assembly resolution. The second special rapporteur, Ambassador Maya Lechto from Finland, has made an impressive work to ensure that this topic was safely taken ashore. The draft principles now reflect the urgent need to enhance the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflict. Ambassador, Ambassador Lesto also managed to cover areas 
that I did not have the time or opportunity to address before I left the commission. So now we see that also occupation and state responsibility are included, and as well as the Martens clause, which is now clearly reflected. Maya Lester has also introduced innovative principles relating to operation and liability of business in enterprises. I, myself, am particularly glad to note that the principles of the remnants of war, which in Ukraine's case is particularly relevant because of all the landmines, uh, are included as separate principles, and so are the remnants of war at sea. Uh, principle. The um, another very important principle I think that was included already in the first draft were the principles of sharing and granting access to information. Because without information, you cannot know what, how, and when, and in what way the environment have, has been destroyed. You cannot collect evidence and you cannot pursue the case in a court. So the work on the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts has come a long way since the top first topic was first initiated in the commission. And it would not have been possible without the backup and support of states, of NGOs, of the ICRC, of academia, academia of all the individuals that have taken their precious time to engage in the topic. We are very, very grateful for that. And it shows how the civil society can act and move important principles and issues forward. It is, and I would now like to conclude by saying a few words about the work made by the high level working group on environmental consequences of war that was co shared by Andre Jermak and Margaret Wallström, my former Ministry for Foreign Affairs, that I had the opportunity to work with when she was a foreign ministry minister. It's an impressive report. Uh, it is available on the internet now, and I think Britta might share it. I think most of our Ukrainian colleagues are probably aware of it, but it's still worth uh, sharing the link to the report. It contains, it contains 50 recommendations, and I have looked, and it's, it, with under, it's the 50 recommendations are listed under three priorities. The first is to monitor the damage and reduce the risk. The second is to ensure accountability. And the third is mobilize green reconstruction and environmental recovery. It is one of the most interesting reports that I have read because it in essence covers all the sequences of how you prevent damage before, during, and after a conflict. And this is exactly a mirror of the International Law Commission's principles, because they are intended to apply before, during, and after an armed conflict. I have carefully read the report by uh, Jamak and Wallström, and I, I can say that there is really, really very little, if anything, that I can comment on that being wrong or from the po point of international law. On the contrary, it is foresighted, it is correct, and it is really an important topic. And we will see, this is something that, is, that Ukraine is supposed to engage in with, it, but also with the assistance of the international community. And uh, Margaret Ralston said that she always thinks that, and I agree entirely with her on this, that the, the environment is nothing extra. It is nothing, it's nothing to do 
it's not it has nothing to do with something that should come later and it is not a luxury so with this i would like to conclude my words uh, and my presentation and i'm i remain open for for questions and comments thank you very much <laughs>